I've been a parent for 30 years. Um, three, three children, two, three different women. Uh, the oldest is uh, just turned 30. Had him when I was very young. Second son was, um, or just turning 12. And then, you know, my daughter in the background there. She's uh, about a year and a half. Uh, with my first son, I, like I said, I was young. I thought I knew everything. Uh, he was planned, if you can believe that. Now, bear in mind, when he was born, this is way before Obamacare was a thing. Um, hospitals were still pretty old-fashioned. You could still smoke in the waiting rooms back then. He uh, had, some, had some trouble with him. He uh, was breech, uh, and there were other complications. Uh, so he had to be taken uh, emergency C-section. Um, and back then, when you got a C-section, it was usually an emergency. The only, the only exceptions to that were like previous C-sections. Uh, they tended to deliver all subsequent pregnancies via C-section after that. But that was it. It wasn't like an option. Now, son number two, the whole process was planned out uh, right up to the date of birth. He, we made an appointment. Just it kind of flabbergasted me that you could... Um, plan when you're going to have your child you know so you like schedule your vacation around it or something and my daughter she was uh again unexpected there were some complications uh when she was born when she was born the, the pregnancy itself was fine flawless actually uh, mother stayed healthy throughout the entire process uh baby was healthy throughout the entire process she just came a little early so they had to um hook her up to stuff uh she needed some oxygen you know because preemies have a underdeveloped lungs, so they need a little little push in the beginning. Uh, there are some jaundice issues, so, you know, the um, the Billy Rubin blanket, you can see the blue light there. Uh, that's a treatment they use for jaundice. Uh, encourages vitamin D production, uh, that kind of thing. She was born post-Obamacare. The other two were born pre. Um, now, this isn't going to be a whole slamming on Obamacare thing. Um, it's just my experiences with the changing face of healthcare over the last 30 years. Number one son. A lot of healthcare back then was still paid out of pocket. Insurance didn't cover things like checkups. Parents had a lot more control over healthcare. You decided, you know, what doctor you're going to use, um, whether or not they got the inoculations how often they went to the appointments, um, if they went to the appointments at all. It was all left up to the parents for, for the most part. Um, now, if you wanted to go to public school, of course, you had to have the shots and all that. Medical records had to be all up to date uh, for public school. And, you know, that still applies today, of course, but much more so. The third one, we went to the doctor's visits uh, for the most part. Uh, she skipped a few of them um, simply because they, she just didn't deem them necessary. Because most of them you go in, they check their weight, or they check your weight, they um, ask you questions. Uh, there's no exam, really. Uh, it's just a question and answer period and uh, stepping on the scale. And uh, pointless. A lot of them are simply pointless. Um, we weren't having any concerns. So she just decided to skip a few of them. Now, we went to the important ones, you know, the ones where they um, try to determine the sex of the baby, uh, the ones where they, you know, where you first hear the heartbeat with the ultrasound and well, all that, the, the important ones. Um, when, when delivery day came, mom went into labor normally. I mean, that, like I said, the whole, whole entire process with the third child was clockwork. My father came, picked us up, took us to the hospital uh, and dropped us off, which was amazing. You know, if, if you ever have a child, you'll appreciate not having people around in the hospital because you, I, the mother's looking horrible. She's just you know, given birth and feels miserable, is in pain. You know, prior to there's a lot of pain. Afterwards, there's quite a bit of pain too. It's all part of the process, of course, but um, you don't want a bunch of people lingering around. Uh, you don't want to have to play host to a bunch of people. And uh, fortunately, we were able to keep most people at bay. Uh, we did allow one day of visitation because we're in. Uh, they kept the baby for a week, and um, we were there for most of that. I think the very last day, I took mom home so she could get some sleep, just a good night's sleep without worrying about anything, while the baby was still at the hospital, and then the next day we went and picked her up. During the delivery is when we first started having issues with health care. Mom's laying on the delivery table, 
and they started pushing the epidural. Uh, she was, you know, much to her credit and my surprise, to be honest. Um, I really didn't give her enough credit. She would, she handled the pain like a trooper. It, yeah, it hurt, but didn't see the need for pain management. Didn't see the need for the epidural, but they kept pushing it and pushing it. In fact, in a one thirty-minute period, they'd asked her seven times if she would like the epidural, and kept saying no, no. And finally, we just relented just to shut them up. Um, she, neither one of us wanted it. We're not big fans of unnecessary medical procedures. Um, if you don't need it, don't do it. Body can fix itself, or if you can withstand the pain, you know, there's no reason to uh, introduce anything that doesn't need to be there. But like I said, it was, it, she was stressed giving birth you know it's a stressful thing and you got all these people badgering you to take part in this procedure that you don't want to take part in finally just relented uh, she did uh, no I, I made my opinions on it known but in that situation you the, the father has no say over anything the mother is in complete control all decisions are hers um, now if she, you know if she asks for guidance of course you help out um, I should point out that there's a pretty significant age gap between the mother and I, um, I think it's 23 years difference in age. I'm nearly 50, and she's going to be 25 this 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 year, I believe. Uh, and she kind of leaned on me a little bit for uh, help and advice and whatnot. But um, all these decisions were ultimately hers. Relented, got the epidural. Um, they did it wrong. I, I don't know what happened. Whether the uh, catheter was in crooked or the, what, I, I don't know. I don't know. Not deep enough. I don't know. Uh, for for those of you that don't know, an epidural is um, they take a needle encased in a catheter, a uh, flexible catheter tube, uh, and, they, and then they insert it between two of your vertebrae. And then when they pull the needle out, they leave the catheter behind, and the catheter um, transmits drugs into the spinal fluid, and it, it effectively shuts all sensation from the point of the epidural down, sh shuts down all sensation. And there's there, there's been some studies that show a um, breakdown of the mother-child bond with parents who get epidurals uh, because there's like uh, chemicals released you know um, during pregnancy that that form that bond that's also you know the same reason why mothers tend to forget how painful delivery was these chemicals kind of shut off those memories but they're also there's also a process involved in forming that bond and the pain is a part of the process when you take that away some of that bond is severed. Fortunately, in our case, the epidural didn't take. Uh, the, the anesthesiologist came in to check on her after he administered the first round of medication, and she should have been she should have been numb from the waist down. Uh, but when he applied, did the ice test, they apply ice to the skin to see if you feel the cold, and um, she felt it. S swore up and down that she could feel the ice everywhere, you know, all all the way up and down her legs, she could feel it. He looked at her like she was lying. Truth came out, though, after delivery, when she, mom got up off the table and walked to the restroom to clean herself up. Um, if you get an epidural, you can't walk because you can't feel your legs. <laughs> she didn't have any trouble getting up off the table. I mean, other than the obvious soreness of just having delivered a child. There was there was one point during the delivery where one of the nurses, some very progressive nurse, was in attendance. Um, a doctor four nurses immediately around the mother and then in the background was a wall of other medical personnel because the child was preemie there was like six or seven other people back there with all these carts and trays and uh, trolleys and whatnot full of medical apparatus just in case there was any complications so you know picture that you're a relatively young female having your first child not a lot of exposure to health care because she's not a big fan of doctors either no not that we're opposed to doctors, we just don't like people getting in our business. Um, private people. So here she is, exposed, you know, hoo-ha hanging out, um, all these people all over the place. But she, she said later that uh, she wasn't even thinking about it. She was just so focused on what, what was happening, the process of giving birth, that she barely even realized that there was other people there. So, small blessing. Anyhow, back to the the nurse. The, one of these, one of the nurses. Um, most of the nurses were top notch. Uh, excellent, excellent work by the nursing staff. But one of them asked her if she wanted, like, when, after the baby's head popped, asked her if she wanted to reach down and touch the head. And I looked at her, and the doctor looked at her, 
and even some of the other nurses kind of looked at her. And the doctor said, is that something you get a lot of positive response to? And um, that, that was sufficient to shut her up. It, it was just an odd request. And, and we're not those kind of people. You know, sure, if you want to touch your baby's head, fine. Touch your baby's head. I don't care. But don't make those assumptions. The, but the doctor through asking her that, did remind her of her place in the process, and her place was to assist the doctor. Uh, so she'd overstepped her bounds. The doctor reminded her of that. I was grateful to the doctor for doing so because it, it ended an awkward situation very quickly. Baby came out. Well, the baby's head was out, and apparently nowadays, because before they would wait till the baby was all the way out, and then they'd suck out all the snot and the mucus -y stuff from the mouth and the nose and the ears and whatnot, get it all so she could start using her own lungs. But apparently now they just wait till the head pops out, so you got this head sticking out. Just the head. Just the head. It was like a horrible alien movie. The doctor was sucking the snot and getting ready to, turning to get the thing to suck the snot out of the baby's uh, nose, uh, mucus out of the baby's nose. And uh, mom wasn't done. No, the baby was coming. The baby's coming now. So like mid, mid turn, she pushed the final push and the baby just came right out. The doctor had to quickly reach down and grab, grab her. It was literally over in like 10 minutes. She did so well with it. She pushed when she needed to. She didn't when she didn't. And um, she even reminded them that, you know, I'm the mom. I'm running the show. <laughs> You're here to assist me. Just like those nurses are there to assist the doctor, the doctor's there to assist the mother. Natural process. Mother's been doing it for thousands of years. Unfavorable experiences regarding that part of the process. And then we get into, you know, they give the baby to the mother, you know, the that initial skin-to-skin -skin bond, and um, and quickly whisk the baby away, because like I said, she was she was breathing fine, but she did. I'm not denying that she did need the uh, uh, need to be put on the respirator for a little while uh, just to get her lungs functioning properly. But it, it just kind of, it was kind of upsetting that they didn't give her that moment. They they just kind of snatched it away real quick. What else? Uh, baby's born. She's in the uh, baby room where you know the little baby storage area and then after some testing they discovered the jaundice and that's when they started um the uh, billy rubin treatment uh it basically exposing the child ultraviolet light this was in the middle of winter or the beginning of winter so um taking her outside and just exposing her to natural sunlight wasn't an option so they did the uh, billy rubin treatment um to get her levels back up and that was fine didn't have a problem with that it was a necessary thing jaundice can be bad uh, there was at one point where they actually told us we could not take our child home until we watched these instructional videos. It's like four or five hours worth of videos that she, she doesn't want to sit there and watch these videos. She's miserable. She's you know trying to recoup her strength, and you know, we're getting ready to take the baby home, and we're getting ready to enter into this marathon uh, ordeal of raising a child. Those first few months are horrible, <laughs> good horrible, but horrible. There's no sleep, uh, diapers, feedings. Uh, she's not eating. She is eating. Is she still breathing? Oh my God, you check on them every five minutes when they're sleeping to make sure they're still breathing. Constant stress, constant tension. So you don't need anything else added to it, but whatever. It just seemed like the entire hospital stay was designed to do nothing but add more tension, add more stress. Kind of a reversal of how uh, I'm pointing this out because it was the exact opposite with the first child. With the first child, they didn't meddle. They let you be parents. Uh, this is your child. Uh, you come in and feed the child. I mean, we'll, we'll have nurses there, and if mom's incapable of doing so, you know, we will um, assist. But you were encouraged to take a very active role in the, the feeding and the caring and the changing of the diapers and all that stuff. That's where you learn how to do it if you've never done it before because they have you know, professionals right there to guide you through the process, but they want you to do it. We couldn't wait to get our daughter home. We couldn't wait to take care of her ourselves, and they just wouldn't let us. We tried to keep her in the room, and um, you know, it's, we had to stay at the hospital because she was preemie, but uh, we tried to keep her in the room with us overnight, and um, they just kept wanting to take her back, take her back, take her back. And, Anyhow, enough of that. We got the baby home. Baby was fine. Uh, at the time, we were living in a one-bedroom apartment. We didn't plan on having the child. Came as a complete surprise. Didn't know mom could have kids. 
for whatever various medical reasons, didn't didn't think she was capable of having children. It turned out we were wrong, and we didn't find out about the pregnancy until into uh, the second trimester, uh, four months into the process. So we were very ill prepared, very ill prepared. Thank God for friends and family. That's what I got. I, they they really stepped up. Um, I don't think we had to buy diapers for the first six months. We did the breastfeeding thing for as long as possible, but mom had issues um, producing milk uh, sufficient quantity. But, uh, and this is breastfeed. If you have to pump, pump, I don't care. If you're not comfortable with breastfeeding, if you're not comfortable with latching a child onto your breast, then pump. The, the, the nutrients that they get from that milk, is just it's such a huge boost to their immune system. I mean, if, obviously, if there's, there's a medical reason why you can't, then don't. But if you can, in any conceivable way, do so, at least for the first few months, do so. Uh, even if you have to supplement it, um, you know, with formula or whatever. It's one of those situations where even a little bit is a good thing. But anyhow, we get the baby home, and we're living in our crappy little one-bedroom apartment. It's just not suitable for raising a child. But we toughed it out for a little while until we moved into the place that we're in now, a much bigger place. Doctor's visits were interesting. With my first son, I don't remember the abundance of inoculations that children receive. I, I think it was something like within our first two years, 40 different inoculations within the first two years. And that seems to me excessive. Uh, so I started going through the list uh, of planned inoculations. Uh, and that included flu shots, which, no, sorry, not having it. Uh, and I want to get this... You know, right out in the open, I am not anti-vax. I am very pro-vaccine um, for the ones that can't be fought off naturally. Yeah, polio, awesome, great, shoot, shoot me up. Measles, maybe not. Um, mumps, eh, probably not. Uh, chicken pox, I can see the validity in it because um, later on in life, you know, those who had had chicken pox as a child um, tend to have a greater occurrence of shingles in their senior years. So I can see some validity in that one. I've had chicken pox, I've had mumps, I've had measles, I survived them all. In fact, when I was a kid, they'd have um, measles parties. One, one of the kids in the neighborhood got the party, or got the measles, all the parents in the neighborhood brought their kids over and just rubbed them all over, not literally, but exposed them to the virus so that all the kids in the neighborhood could get it. So all the parents dealt with it all at once and it was done. And it, it, was, it was kind of a neat thing. Uh, very. Well, there, there were communities back then, too, and that's something we just don't have anymore. Communities are a thing of the past now. Neighborhoods, neighbors. Um, I mean, how many of you know your neighbors' names, uh, let alone any details about your neighbors, like where they work or whatever? We got lucky with this place. Uh, we moved right into a nice little neighborhood uh, with families and people watching out for each other's kids. Uh, it was very lucky. First doctor's visit comes, and it's with um, a pediatrician who's new to, new on the scene. Uh, the, the the one that we wanted to go to was booked, didn't have any openings, so we agreed to try this other doctor out. When we get to the appointment and we meet the doctor for the first time, we're confronted with a very short, very stout woman, face covered in blemishes, very young, probably fresh out of medical school. I, I don't know. It didn't didn't take a lot of time to get to know her. All I can remember is. Like her chin in particular, just riddled with pockmarks and blemishes and, and crusted over bits that uh, had previously been blemishes. And it, it just looked like somebody who doesn't take care of themselves at all, at all. Um, no exercise, no, you know, and maybe there's some underlying medical condition that leads to the complexion issues. I don't know. I don't know. I, and I don't care. So I had to give her a shot, though, because, you know, you know appearances can be deceiving. She asks about, you know, our lives and whether we have any more kids. And I explain that I do have two other children to uh, previous engagements. But this is the mother's first child. And I ask her if she has any kids. And she says, no, I don't. I haven't had any kids yet. But I do have three cats. And, yeah, okay. No, we're done here. We're, we're, we're done. Uh, I'm sorry. But three cats is not the same. I understand that she went to medical school and she probably did well I don't know I didn't look at her transcripts but I just have a problem with a pediatrician that doesn't have children would you take your car to a mechanic that has never in his life driven a car 
would you ask somebody to build you a house who has never in his life picked up a hammer? Well, the same goes for this, because in addition to the textbook knowledge that you get while you're in university college, learning to become a doctor, being a parent also gives you the practical side of it. Sometimes kids' noses just run. Not all boo-boos need medical attention. You don't have to rush your child to the hospital every time they, their temperature goes above 99 degrees. You know, a, a pediatrician with children understands this, um, and it has a better foundation uh, to pass that knowledge on to other people, that, that, that expertise, if you will, uh, on to other people. And that's backed up by the textbook knowledge. Yeah, there's that. So next time we came back, it was with a different doctor. When you take your child to these post-Obamacare pediatrician visits, they ask you questions. Anybody in the house a smoker? Do you smoke in the house? Fine. Valid question, especially with the premature baby and the uh, underdeveloped lungs. Yes, you want to know if there's going to be any, anything that's going to affect breathing. Didn't have a problem with that. Uh, any history of this, that, and the other? Um, fine. I understand why you're asking that. Are there any guns in the home? That was a question that I was asked, to which I obviously refused to answer. I, I, I don't want to come off sounding like one of those people, you know what I mean? Uh, because I'm not. I, I, I appreciate the healthcare profession. I appreciate the work that goes into becoming a doctor. I appreciate the expense that goes into becoming a doctor. Um, I've never begrudged a doctor his earnings. Eight years of your life is spent learning how to become a doctor, and then you know there's your internship and your residency, and all. A lot of sacrifices have to be made by an individual before he can actually become a six-figure a year doctor. I have, I'm okay with that, no problems. It's 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 the the union of healthcare and government never works out well. <clears throat> never has worked out well. When uh, healthcare providers provide a service, in order to provide a service, you have to provide the service well, or nobody's going to take part in your service. And that 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 goes with anything. You're not going to hire a guy to shampoo your carpets if he does a shitty job. You're just not going to do it. Same with the doctor. You're not going to use a doctor who doesn't take care of you, who doesn't treat your ailments um, accurately, effectively. Government doesn't have that. Government doesn't understand. Supply and demand. They don't understand having to turn a profit because money is just handed to the government. They don't have to work for it. They don't have to earn it. They just it's just given to them. Uh, taxes. So it, it, uh, free market, free market, any market is is completely alien concept to politicians, uh, to government. They have no frame of reference. The the gun thing. Are there any guns in the home? So I ask, why is that medically relevant? He says, well, it's just one of the questions we ask. I've never been asked that before by a healthcare provider. Um, yeah, I know, but uh, you know, it's a part of the new guidelines. Oh, okay, well, next question. Next appointment, the gun question came up again, and I was very stern with him this time. I, you will not ask me this question again. That is not a medical question. That is none of your business. Next question. Eventually, they got it, and they stopped asking the question. When... I get asked a question, an unrelated question like that. It, you know, red flags start popping. That's the government intervention. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, the amalgamation of government and healthcare is a bad thing. They get too involved in your life. And these people aren't doctors. They're politicians. They're bureaucrats. They're whatever. No medical training whatsoever, and they have complete control, complete access to all your healthcare records now. Uh, because it's all tied together through a, a computer network. I understand the importance of government. I understand the importance of healthcare. I don't want to see the two of them together because <laughs> it doesn't work. One of them has to make money. The other one doesn't understand the concept of making money. There was that. And then there was the, back to the inoculations thing. I, I went through the list and um, started taking things off the list that weren't going. No flu shots, period. No flu shots. People don't die of the flu anymore. I, yes, they do. Uh, there are isolated cases of people dying of the flu, and there are certain strains of the flu that are just really freaking nasty. But in the United States, in most first world countries, uh, the flu is no worse than common cold. We know how to deal with it now. We have med over-the-counter medications that will deal with most of your issues. 
they had her scheduled for like something like 40 inoculations in her first two years. Now, this is a new human being, still coming to terms with the fact that she has lungs, kidneys, and all these various organs, and uh, having to breathe on her own, having to ingest nutrition on her own without going through the umbilical cord. These are all new things for her, and her body's just coming to terms with this. And, and you know, in addition to fighting off all the environmental factors that a n newborn has to fight off, uh, simple little things like dust in the air. Um, these are completely new things to a newborn child. And uh, it, just, it just seems excessive to me to introduce additional issues uh, on this new life. These can be spread out. They don't start school until they're five. You know, not, we're not sending our child to public school, but there's time. You don't have to do it now. So what's the rush? What, uh, yeah, I understand certain ones, you know, like the polio vaccine, like I said. Absolutely, by all means. Shoot her up. Um, you don't want polio. Uh, that was a killer. Some of these other ones, I just don't, don't see the logic behind it. And especially with, you know, again, not an anti-vaxxer. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Uh, very pro-vaccine. Uh, I'm just, I'm also pro-smart. One of the revelations was having this child as opposed to my first one. My first one, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I thought I knew. I thought I knew everything, of course, because I was young. I think I was 17 when he was born. Um, I had an interesting childhood. I was um, thrown to the wolves when I was 15. 16, 17, I thought it was a good idea to become a father. I was wrong. Love the child. Don't get me wrong. Don't regret having him. Don't regret anything about any of my children. With my first one, I thought I knew everything, and I, I really knew absolutely nothing. I was selfish when I was young, when I had my first one. Very selfish. I was young, of course, and all young people are selfish little pricks. So I put my needs ahead of his, to a lesser extent with the second one. But I still hadn't had that epiphany. This one, it really hit home. It really hit home hard how you're... you're, you're a father. You're a parent. You're you have a small life form completely dependent on you for survival, and um, and that's that's your sole purpose on this planet. It's a it's not financial success. It's it's not the amassing of wealth. It's not driving the shiny car. It's not getting the promotion. It's not any of those silly things. It's not the big house with the yard and all that. It, oh, those are all you know things, but they're not important. What's important is this. To such a degree above everything else that, you know, these everything else might as well be at the baseline. Um, and your child is at, at the peak. I don't know if that makes any sense. I, I don't know. You have one purpose on this planet, that is to procreate. That is to create more of you. Along with that goes the responsibility of making sure that that child grows up healthy, well-adjusted, um, a productive member of society. You want to work, you want to earn your own way, you want to pay your own bills, you want to support yourself, and if possible, help out others. That's what it means to be human. But these, this is another one of the epiphanies that you know, came, came with age. My purpose is to raise this child to raise her well, to raise her to the best of my ability, to make sure that she grows up to be a responsible, respectable, contributing member of society. And that's it. Everything else is extraneous. It was, it, was, it was an experience. It was an experience that I'm glad I had. I didn't want it. Didn't want it. Nope. Nope. I'm almost 50 years old. The last thing I want to be doing is sitting, getting down on the floor and changing a diaper. Now I do it 30 times a day. <laughs> You know, a bit of an exaggeration, but yeah. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. Especially now that I know why it's so important. I guess the whole video could have been summed up in that last little bit right there. But I like to ramble, and I like it when people listen. So, thanks for listening, and hope to see you back. Bye. Say night-night. Night-night. <laughs>